Good morning. We're going to go and get ahead and get started. And I'm Deb Carlos, the uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And my pleasure to welcome you to this prime time in the library event. This morning is um, a presentation by Edwin Scholar Award winners, Dr. Brian Hyatt and Anna Peterson. Um, the Edwin Award is a competitive award that Bethel gives to faculty for summer research. So faculty and student research teams apply for that award. And then a series of um, former Edwin Scholar Award winners review those proposals and select four to five for the summer that are funded. Um, so we're going to get to hear from some of those award winners this morning. And um, the Edwin Award um, really encourages faculty and student research. And it's named after John, Ale John Alexis Edwin, our founding um, our founder of Bethel, who really was committed to student faculty research and believed that at the heart of a Bethel education should be the relationship with, between faculty and students, which I think is amazing that he said that in 1871 when he founded Bethel, that one of the key things he felt was important was how faculty and students um, work together in the kind of relationships we build. And um, in my time as a Bethel student, lots of years ago, um, that was certainly one of the most important things for me was the work that I got to do. So it's fun to hear about that kind of research and we'll hear about it this morning. Um, Prime Time, this series is sponsored by the library and is really designed to bring people together to hear about different things that are going on on campus from faculty and students and staff. This is the last Prime Time for this semester, which seems hard to believe that we're a week away from finals. There's four days away from finals. Um, but watch the announcements for the next series that's coming. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Brian and Anna's study about lung development, which is um, Dr. Hyatt's area of expertise. Um, and in a summary that they wrote as uh, part of their proposal, um, I'm going to um, condense it a bit for lay people. How's that? Um, so the lung is one of the last organs to fully develop in air-breathing animals. And as such, its incomplete development can lead to morbidity and mortality in, in uh, prematurely born infants. The determination of genetic mechanisms involving the lung development has primarily used mammalian models, so especially mice. Um, and mice are the most popular because there's been a lot of experiments on them, and there's a lot of similarity to humans. Um, but the investigation of really early lung development um, is harder in mice because of the in utero development. So they're looking at uh, the use of frogs, Xenophus labius frogs. Um, and I'm looking especially at the effects of XER81 and FGF10 overexpression on the development of the lung. So we're going to hear about their findings to date and this week's research and continue. So welcome to Dr. Hyde and, and, and Anna is um, a biology and Spanish major. Okay, thanks for that. Well, thanks, Deb. Um, so Anna and I have this set up, so I'll sort of talk about a little bit of an overview, and then Anna will talk about specifically what we did this summer and where we're going with the research. It's still really awkward for me to talk out loud in the library. Quiet. So uh, Deb saw a little bit of my thunder. I'm going to go over basically what she summarized from the first 10 or so slides, sort of set up um, what we're doing, um, sort of how this research project got developed and then um, what we're currently working on. So the title's a little bit different than what Deb said. Um, Transient Transgenesis to Examine Gene Expression During Xenobus Labus Lung Development. So the, the main theme is um, lung development. And so the first question you have to ask when talking about what you're studying is why you study. Um, so why study lung development? And there's a couple of different reasons to do that. Um, from a basic developmental process from a basic biological question, basic knowledge question. Um, there are things about lung development as a model that allows us to discover things about biology. Um, with lung patterning, differentiation, there's a certain shape, a certain size, cells are in certain places, there's a pattern to the organ itself. So we can ask questions, how does that happen? How does that occur? Um, differentiation, there are different cells that have different jobs, do different things. And so we can ask questions, how did that happen? How do these cells become different from one another? How do they do carry out the function that they're made to carry out? And in those events, then, there are genes that create proteins, create functional molecules that talk to one another. There are cells and tissues that send signals, receive signals, and you can ask, 
how did those signals be received, how did they get sent, what are the signals um, to um, set up a particular organ as such as a lung. And also, it's clinically significant. This is one of the reasons I uh, started studying lung development years before I even came to Bethel as a, a system of study. Um, lung maturity is a big problem. The lungs are one of the last organs to develop in humans and in mammals. And so babies that are born prematurely often have problems with their lungs. Basically, their lungs aren't ready for gas exchange. Okay? And so it's a big problem. One of the types of diseases or syndromes they can get is neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. And there's treatments, there's different things that can be done, but um, there's a certain time point where the lungs just aren't ready to breathe air. And actually, the air starts to damage the lungs because they aren't ready for that. So sort of a long-term goal, then, is discoveries of basic mechanisms to form the lung, hopefully down the line will lead to therapies, cures, and so the more, more we know, the better off um, we'll be in trying to develop things that will end up helping um, or benefit human health. <coughs> okay, so the basic research question, there's two questions, two of them, um, that we're asking what genes are involved in the development of the lung. Okay, very simple. What genes are involved, and really more specifically, what genes are responsible for forming the lung. So forming the very first steps. So we're going to sort of go back to the very earliest events of lung formation or ask questions at those various times. So I wasn't sure exactly what the composition of the audience would be, so, um, so we just have to sort of step back. What are genes? Okay. What are they? How do we study them? Um, simplest explanation, genes are units of information that code for functional products. Okay, so it's an informational unit. It makes a product that does a job. Okay, all our cells have all that information. They use that information to make miniature machines, if you will. All those machines carry out a particular job, and they all have to carry out the job they're doing for everything to work correctly. All right. Give you an idea how many genes do we have? Organisms have humans have around 25,000. We don't know exactly how many genes we have. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student in the class, um, the number was between 50 to 100,000. That was the estimate. And so in the last 20 years, they've greatly dropped the number of genes that they think organisms have. So humans are believed to have around 25,000. Um, so how does that relate? So in lung development, we want to know which of those genes are involved in lung development. And what are they doing? Okay, so sometimes you can ask both questions together. Sometimes you ask one at a time which genes are involved and what those genes are doing. Okay, so we know genes are units of information. They encode these functional products. Well, how do we study what those products do? How do we know what the job of a machine is that more or less you really can't see? Okay, so you have to ask, what does it do in different ways? Um, so if we just take a statement, if you have a gene, gene A, gene A is responsible for something. It's responsible or necessary for events X, Y, and Z. We don't know what X, Y, and Z are. Okay, we want to know what it's actually doing. So there's two different ways then to discover what gene A is doing. One is we can remove it. We take away the information. The information's not there. It can't make the product. The product's missing. We can ask what doesn't happen, okay, what doesn't work. Right? And so that's one way to study a gene. The other is to add more of the gene. Okay, put more product into a system, increase the amount of product, and ask what more happens. Okay, So if there's more of A, or more function of A, you'd expect more of whatever it normally does. Okay, So we can ask what it's necessary for, so you remove it to see what doesn't happen, or we can ask what it's capable of. You add it and ask, okay, now what does it do? Okay, and we have to have a way to measure this. Sometimes there's nothing known at all about a gene. All right? and sometimes it's hard to know what to look for. And so sometimes you just let data speak to you or look, um, look at what happens. So a couple of examples of this. Here's no, it doesn't show up so well. Here's an example of the elimination of the FGF10 gene. We're going to talk about the FGF10 gene. It's a gene that we're looking at in lung development. If this gene is eliminated in mice, there are drastic changes. So here's a normal mouse pup. Here, here's a mouse pup where the FGF10 gene has been eliminated. It's seen pretty clearly 
The big thing is it's missing four limbs and hind limbs. That's not Photoshop. It's actually missing all of its limbs. It, um, related to what we're looking at, so there's a skeletal structure showing the same thing. Related to what we're looking at, if you open these little guys up, they're also missing their lungs. Complete absence of lungs. Okay, so this gene then, what does it do? Well, it's necessary for lung formation. It's got to be there. So there's one way to look at it. The opposite way, this is some work I did before I came to Bethel, is again to add functionality. So these little beads here, this is tissue culture. These little beads have been soaked in the FGF10 protein. So they represent a really concentrated source of this machine, of this functional product. And what we've done here is, this is tracheal cells, and we've eliminated the normal source of the gene to ask, well, what will it do to those particular cells? And across the top here, these are 24-hour pictures. So this is one day, second day, third day, fourth day. And what we can see is you have this source of this FGF10 and this epithelium, these cells actually grow towards that source. Okay? And so what it looks like FGF10 is doing is it's acting as a chemoattractant. It's attracting the growth of cells towards it. Okay? So again, another example now we're looking at, we're adding it. What does it do? What well, does a specific thing? Um, down here, then, what we did is we took these pieces of tissue and we ran them through an experiment. We asked, do they express a particular gene? Okay? A gene that is only expressed in the lung. So now we're asking a real specific question. Can this protein cause something to happen? And we drew a little yellow arrow here because when we do the procedure, the beat sort of falls off. But in blue here is the location or our cells that are expressing a gene called surfactant protein C. This is a gene that is only expressed in lungs. Okay? It's not expressed anywhere else. And normally, I didn't show the control here, but normally if you culture this all alone without a source of FGF10, it won't express that gene. So in addition to chemoattracting this tissue, it also turns on, or what we say, induces the expression of a specific gene. Okay, so now we know a couple of things that this protein or this gene does. And you know, a number of different people have done more work on this and discovered even more things that it does. <laughs> Okay, so that's how you study a gene. That's one particular gene we're actually studying and a couple ways to study it. So what do we know and what are we specifically looking for? So I'll give a little bit of background here and then I'll turn it over to Anna and she'll talk about uh, how we carried out the experiments and where we're at in that process. So what do we know? Well, we know a lot is known about lung development in mammals. Okay, no bother reading this. I'll show you a picture here. Um, there's a lot of people working on lung development in mammals. Uh, specifically for the clinical significance. And there's lots of medical doctors, a lot of researchers uh, working on these problems because of um, the issues with neonatal health and lung development. So this is just how the lung develops. Basically, early on development, all of us started as something that really didn't look like what we look at like now. And there's a little tube that goes, and that tube still exists from your mouth to your back end. Okay? And along that tube, different things started budding off or branching off your liver, um, your pancreas, and your lungs. Okay, so you have a tube and you have things that basically grew off of that tube, created a lot of our internal organs. And so the lung forms that way. There's the tube originally there, it starts to butt off, forms left and the right side. So eventually you get your esophagus where you're swallowing all your food, and then you get your trachea leading to the lungs where you have gas exchange. Okay, another aspect of FGF10, if you look at this, it starts to branch. It sort of branches like a tree or a bush would branch. All these different tubes branch out in different areas. And FGF10, I showed you, is a chemoattractant. It draws out tissue. So how this, the lung knows where to form these branch points is because FGF10 is actually expressed at particular locations there, and it actually draws those tissues out. So that's one of its jobs. So anyway, there's a lot known about mammalian lung development um, to the important genes, which we'll uh, talk about in our research, which I just talked about, FGF10, required for lung development, chemotractin, and induces this surfactant gene expression. Again, these surfactant genes are only in the lung. They sort of define lungness. The tissue is expressing the surfactant gene. By definition, it's a lung cell. Okay, so we can make that claim. Um, another gene that we know is um, 
express and important for mammalian lung development is NKX 2.1. Um, it's also the earliest marker of lung development. Marker meaning, I'll show you what it means in a minute, but it's, it marks the location of where the lung will develop. Um, it's required for normal lung development. If you eliminate this gene, you still have lungs, but they don't work. Okay, the mice die at birth. They basically form big cystic sacs. They look nothing like a normal lung. And there's some tissue there, but they don't have the stuff they need. For example, they don't have the surfactant genes or the protein products that they need. So two important genes. Um, although a lot is known about lung development in mammals, the one sort of whole is the really early steps. So, oh, so going through this, this is NKX 2.1, just showing that it's actually a marker for lung development. So here's this tube that forms very early in all mammals and a lot of different organisms. And this purple here then indicates where NKX 2.1 is. It's expressed in the thyroid, but it's also expressed in the trachea and the lung. But it's not expressed where the liver forms, not expressed where the pancreas forms. So this is actually it can't really tell that it's a tube here that actually isn't completely closed, um, but it's just showing where it's expressed. And the next half day later in a mouse, it's expressed in the developing lung. So there's two lung buds, there's a trachea there, and still also in the thyroid. So we know that this gene marks lung development. So a lot is normal mammalian lung development. We also knew, and this was years ago when I started here at Bethel, very little is known about lung development in Xenophis. Okay, so when I got here, I was looking for a project that was economical, okay, something that didn't cost a lot of money to do, student friendly, we could get undergraduate students involved in doing it, and had questions that could be answered. Okay, and so looking at lung development in Xenopus then sort of met all those criteria. And so very little was known. So we started the project, uh, myself and a lot of students, and uh, collaborated on at the University of Minnesota with the anticipation that genes that are expressed in mammalian lungs that are important for mammalian development will also be expressed in amphibian lungs or in frog lungs. So the first question we asked was that true? That anticipation, that hypothesis, was that true? Um, and so some of the strengths of using Xenopus for these questions was external development. So mammals develop internally. It's hard to access them. It's hard to do experimental perturbations. But Xenopus developed in salt water, sitting on your microscope. So it's easy to um, get in there and do different experiments. So accessible and less expensive. So that's what a, an adult Xenopus looks like. They're pretty large, probably about the size of my hand for a big, healthy um, adult. Um, and this is what they look like as embryos or tadpoles. This is a side view. That black is the eye there. This yellow stuff is the developing intestines. It's got a lot of yolk cells in there, which it uses for nutrition while it's growing initially. And of course, um, it's long tail. The lung actually forms right on top of that yolk sac. The heart's forming right down there, and the mouth is right up front there. This is just the same embryo laying on its back. Very special about that. Um, this is not Xenophis, but closely related. This is a Ranopipians frog, just showing sort of a gruesome picture, but I'm um, showing what the adult lung looks like. Here's an adult lung, almost fully inflated after the dissection. One of the lobes of the lung. Here's one lobe and another lobe showing both lobes of the lung here. Uh, both these females are filled with, all this stuff here is actually eggs. They lay lots and lots of eggs, and that's one of the reasons we use these, because they produce lots and lots of tadpoles to do our studies on. Okay, so the question then, real basic question, does Xenopus have or express the same genes associated with lung development? Do they have NKX 2.1? Do they have SPC, surfactant protein C? Uh, so again, here's the NKX 2.1. Um, this is work done by a different group, a couple of different groups published that NKX 2.1 is expressed in Xenopus lungs before I started this project. And I just uh, point you down here. Here's uh, developing lung in Xenopus here. Here's another part of developing lung. And this colored area then indicates where NKX 2.1 is being developed. So we knew that gene at least was expressing the exact same cells in frogs as it was in mammals. So um, I confirm that. Some of my work here, there's the developing lung there, showing NKX 2.1 expression. We then went and looked for surfactant protein C and surfactant protein B. So this is a picture of a mouse lung here, about embryonic day 13 and a half. Um, a lot of branch points, it's sort of out of focus, it's, it's 
very three-dimensional at this point. But all this purple stuff in here is where SPC is being expressed. Exclusive to the lung, exclusive to the inner cells of the lung. So we asked the question, can we find that in frogs? And it turns out we could, and it's also only expressed in the lung. And so early work, the frog lung looks a little bit different, sort of looks like a horseshoe here. So this is a view you're looking actually at the back of a tadpole. You know, they're in the solution where you can see partially through them. It's called clearing solution. Um, there's the lungs there, there's the eyes, this is the head, and the guts on the bottom half. A couple days later, the lungs grown out further, but it's still sort of this U shape. You take a side view, you turn that embryo on its side, you can see it's sitting right on top of this gut area here. So that was SPC, SPB, so packing protein B, related but different protein, same thing. These are just sections showing the tubes, single tubes, and then the two tubes of the lung also expressing this um, gene. And this is just a drawing to sort of show you where's everything at here. Um, so here's a tube, goes through, you get an enlargement here, forms a stomach, you get the intestines, you get the pancreas, grows out, the liver grows out, the bladder, and then the lung grows out. It actually grows out on the ventral side of that gut tube, but then the way it grows, it sort of grows and ends up dorsally or sitting on the back side of that gut tube. And here's just real um, gut tubes and lungs. Here's gut tube here, enlarged, and there's a lung in this horseshoe shape showing the expression of this SPC. And this uh, shows here, there's sort of this hazy stuff here. Those are cells on the outside of the lung, and the inside of the lung is the only part that's blue, showing that this gene not only is only in the lung, but it's only in the exact same cells as it is in mice. Okay, so what do we know? What are we looking for? We know then that these genes are similar in the frog as they are in mice, which means then that we can use them as markers for lung. Okay? So what are we looking for? So what are we looking for is we can look for the expression of these genes as an indicator to how the lung is forming. Okay? If there's more of these genes being expressed, there's more lungs or there's more lung cells being formed. If there's less, it means there's less lung being formed. If they're expressed in the wrong place, the wrong area, we can analyze why are they in the wrong place or wrong area. So then what we're going to do is Anne is going to tell you one of the ways that we look at that. Okay, okay. so um, this summer we looked at the methodology of overexpressing the FGF10 gene in the Xenophis labor flock. So here's kind of an overview of the methodology that we went over and solidified. Um, we used recombinant DNA, we um, purified that to, and injected that into our um, Xenophis embryo. Then we used heat shock treatments with this specific plasmid um, to induce the overexpression of FGF10. Um, and then we also used this plasmid, um, which has a specific protein in it, or a gene for a protein, um, called green fluorescent protein um, to kind of analyze whether or not the plasmid was working. Um, then we extracted the RNA after stage 40 um, in the developing embryo and did PCR. And if you were a little confused on that, it's all right. I'm going to be going into greater depth on all of them. <laughs> so how did we prepare the DNA? We used the method called um, recombinant DNA so we use what's called a plasmid. It's a circular piece of DNA. It's very small as compared to the chromosomal DNA. And it can be used to carry in foreign DNA into different um, organisms. Um, so one of the things that we did was cut this plasmid with the restriction enzyme, which opens up the plasmid as seen in the first drawing. Then we cut the specific gene with the same restriction enzymes um, and ligated them together, completing the DNA plasmid once again. Um, we grew this in a bacterial culture and then purified it, and then were able to inject that into the embryo. This is a schematic of the specific plasmid that we used. Um, when I started doing research my sophomore year, we had, I think, four different plasmids that Dr. Hyatt had received, and we didn't really know which one would work best. So through a lot of troubleshooting, we um, finally settled on the heat shock protein um, PHSHSG2, 
And some of the specific things that are important about this plasmid is that it has the heat shock promoters in right there and in front of that gene. And that means that when this is injected and if the organism is placed in heat, the um, transcription elements will come and start transcribing the gene that is downstream of it. So um, we place the FGF10 gene um, downstream of one of the promoters and then also the green fluorescent protein was a part of this plasmid and allowing uh, a green fluorescent color to come about if transcription of the plasmid was occurring. Um, and also um, on this side there is what's called an AMP resistant gene. So this allows us to um, decide and analyze what cells have taken up the plasmid um, so that we can purify it and analyze it. So then once we purify this plasmid, how with the gene in it, how do we get it into the Xenopus embryo? So this is done through microinjection. We um, decided to inject at the 16 cell stage in these two cells right here. They're a little hard to see on this picture. But these two cells are um, responsible for the formation of the foregut. So it was a way of controlling where the gene is going to be expressed. And if it is expressed then and it has um, effects on the cells, it won't be affecting the whole embryo, but the specific area where the lung is formed. And so this is another picture, and the orange represents the arrows of just where we are injecting. And so it has a major contribution to the ventral hindgut, pharynx, foregut, liver, and eventually the lungs. So then how do we get this gene to express in the Xenopus embryo? Um, I mentioned it a little bit before, but we use um, heat shock treatments on all of our um, treatment groups. So the, we had three treatment groups, our experimental, which was the FGF10 injected. Um, we injected embryo also with just the plasmid to see if there was a difference between, um, or if the, the difference was being caused by the gene itself or just by extra DNA. And then we also had an uninjected treatment group to know whether the heat shock was causing um, differences in the embryo or if it was actually the DNA. So we used um, cycles of heating and cooling. We would start at um, heating the embryo for 23 minutes at 35 degrees Celsius, and then we would place them in an incubator at 16 degrees for 15 minutes. And that cycle would be repeated three times. Um, we would do this for three days, um, and through troubleshooting and figuring it out, um, it was good only to do it once a day, otherwise the embryo had um, serious effects from the heat shock. So then, once we had heat shocked, how did we know whether the gene was being expressed before we were able to quantify it? And that's where the green fluorescent protein comes in. So as seen on the plasmid, um, once you induce it with heat, you will also not only get the expression of the FGF10 gene, but also of the green fluorescent protein. And so um, here are two pictures of the green, green fluorescent protein being expressed in the embryo. So what we would do is we would separate them into 24 well plates, each with an individual embryo, and we would give them um, a marker of strong, medium, or weak, and um, depending on uh, how much GFP was being expressed. Um, our strong was considered, it was very bright, and it was seen all over the embryo. So then how did we quantify the actual amount of FGF10 expressed in the embryo? We used first RNA extraction from the embryo at stage 40, and then we changed that into cDNA through reverse transcription, and then we would use PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. Um, so first we would figure out, um, quantify the amount of FGF10 expressed and overexpressed in all of our treatment groups. And then once we did that, we looked at kind of the downstream effects 
um, such as Dr. Hyatt mentioned, of SPC um, and NKX 2.1. So just kind of an overview of what polymerase chain reaction is. It is the process of amplifying exponentially um, specific DNA. So what happens is in the first step, as seen in the diagram, you denature the DNA with heat so that specific primers can bind to the gene of interest. Then after that, um, with free nucleotides in, this, in the solution, you are able to extend the DNA sequence, thereby replicating it. So, and then this process is repeated for about 35 cycles until you have an amplified amount. Um, the way we were able to quantify how much we had through this process was by creating a PCR standard curve. So every run that we did, we would have um, a set of known amounts of DNA, um, and we would run that, and then we created a standard curve with the PCR machine, and then we could plug in the numbers that we got for our unknowns and quantify based on the standard curve how much FGF10 was expressed in our treatment groups. So um, as kind of an overall result from the summer, we found um, strong support for a correlation between the amount of GFP expressed and FGF10 expressed. So as you can see up on the screen, every time um, it was considered a strong um, signal of GFP, we had more FGF10 expressed. And in each of these treatment groups are one embryo um, in a single tube, so they're single RNA extracted. So it's a fairly small sample size, um, but since we're kind of solidifying the methodology of this research, we had to spend a lot of time and embryos to um, decide when should we heat shock it, when is the best time to extract RNA, how many embryos should we have per tube um, when we when we try and quantify. So, um, so maybe not the best sample size, but we are getting evidence of a strong correlation between the two. So, and we definitely solidified this methodology. Um, it took a while with troubleshooting with the plasmids and then um, deciding what to do with heat shock, but um, we, have, we have gotten it to work and we have gotten FGF10 to be overexpressed in the embryo. So, and we have also, as I mentioned before, seen the GFP correlation with the GFP expression and FGF10 expression. Um, and our downstream effects are still to be determined. We have done everything up until then. We have made, um, we've extracted the RNA, made cDNA, we've expressed this gene, and um, we actually got a new PCR machine this summer. So. Um, we are still working on um, making sure that we have everything and then testing that out. So we're right on the cusp of finding out kind of if the downstream effects have been increased by this increase in FGF10 um, and what genes those are. Okay. Any questions? about what surprised you during the research? Is there anything so far that surprised you about the process or what it was like to work with these materials? What, what caught your attention? Um, I think for me, just how long of a process it is to prepare the DNA, um, to prepare everything in order to inject. It's quite a long process of cutting the DNA, um, amplifying it, being sure that it um, is in the plasmid, then testing it and growing a, a larger batch, and then testing that, then purifying that. So that was definitely a longer process, and that's kind of what I spent my whole sophomore year working on was purifying and um, making that recombinant DNA. So I would say that's kind of what surprised me the most. How has your research this summer uh, influenced kind of where are you thinking of going with your life? Um, I was quite surprised at how much I enjoyed doing research this summer. 
Um, I really enjoyed the process of it, and I felt like I learned a lot. Um, I don't think I will be in the lab the rest of my life. I don't think um, that this is what I'd like to do, but I um, have loved seeing how this can be clinically significant. And um, Lord willing, I will be going to med school and become a doctor, so I know that this step is very important in um, the, the field of medicine. Could you talk a little bit about what, you know, the long term, how it might be used in the future someday, the research, how would it, you know, work for neonatal? Yeah, so, you know, it's at a basic level, and the idea is, if, so, so theoretically, so if we know how FGF10 works, if we have enough understanding about how it causes outgrowth, of the parts of the lung, um, it could potentially be used then as an application to mature lungs um, as a treatment. So um, there are different treatments that people use now, but if you know enough about the process, then you can target that process with the molecules, you know, do it naturally to try and use it yeah, to fix problems. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a lot of hand waving in between there that <laughs> has to be sorted out, but yeah, that, that's, that's you know, sort of a line of reasoning I would see. Will you go to the slide that you have the FGF expression on the second time? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, it says expression level, like what, how do you, yeah. how did you determine that amount, or what is it that you measure or quantify to get that level? For the level of GFP expression or of the FGF10 that was based on PCR. Um, yep. yep. And then, we'll get, like, and then the GFP levels are based on what we determined to be strong or medium. So I would look through it, and then Dr. Hyatt would confirm, okay, yes, this would be a strongly um, expressing embryo. I have another question about like future treatments. Um, where would you be able to get the molecules if it were possible to inject them? Where would you get them? Yeah. Um, well, if they would be used medically, they would, you know, after they go through all the safety requirements and drug development, I'm sure. Only. <laughs> can, oh, can you make? Oh, yeah, they already do. Yeah, so you can. Buy, I showed the experiment when I had the, the bead with the FGF10. We can actually buy that. We can't use it <laughs> except for research right now. But yeah, we, we can synthesize, <laughs> you can synthesize that molecule right now. Yeah. Yeah. So an example for, um, of how some of the things are used, I talked about the surfactant protein C. Um, when that was first discovered, they discovered where it was expressed. It was only expressed in lungs. They discovered it was expressed in this, this mixture that coats the lungs. Um, and the person I worked with doing research before I came here, um, he actually ended up selling the rights to a drug company, and they synthesized that as a treatment right, that's used right now for neonates that are in lungs. They basically inject that down the trach, get into the lungs, and it helps to, to coat the lungs until the baby develops enough so that it can make its, make its own surfactant in there. So that's sort of a direct, from years ago, but direct use of that. Do you plan on continuing the experiment again with more samples, or is this the end of this project? No. We, uh, well, I hope to continue this. Um, I'm going to be studying about next semester, but hopefully my senior year, um, I would like to continue this project. I feel like we're right on the edge of finding out um, what we were looking for or how to continue on in a new way. So, yes. Yeah. Anna literally has tubes in the freezer waiting <laughs> to be analyzed for data. So, and what we didn't talk about is we actually looked at another gene that I was working on side by side while Anna was working on FGM10 that another student is also working on. And literally with tubes in the freezer sort of waiting. Um, she mentioned we got a new machine and sort of everything, 
every new piece of equipment takes a little while to sort of ramp up and launch so we, we have it figured out. Just, we have material, we're just waiting on it. Also, so you decided to use a particular organism. Were, did you, were you satisfied with your choice? Like, did it really, it sounds like it achieved what you wanted, and would you say that it, you would continue using the same organism, or would you try a different one next time, or? I guess it's more for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, a little bit of validation for using this organism. No one had used amphibians for long development, and um, this summer slash fall, three papers came out looking at lung development in Zenfys. Um, so all of a sudden other labs are realizing that um, this is a good system and some really cool results came out of it, some of which you know, sort of verified the path we want to take, some of which sort of answered some of the questions we wanted to answer, but um, still left enough questions out there to continue the research. So, um, and I was really, really pleased this um, this fall. The Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine went to the researcher who used and has used Xenobus forever. Not what we're doing, but I just learned about that. So, <laughs> but that was pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you too. Thank you.